following is a production of Temple University Beasley School of Law. I'm uh, Jonathan Lipson, the Harold Cohn Professor of Law at Temple University Beasley School of Law. Thank you for joining us today for forging and following new paths to success, a conversation about uh, innovation and value with A.J. Raju. Um, as I think many of you know, A.J. is one of our stars. Um, later today, he's going to be inducted into Temple's Gallery of Success. But we were lucky enough to be able to get him to come and talk with us today um, about how he got there um, uh, for both the benefit of you folks in the room and other students, recent law graduates, um, in order to understand better how to become successful. Um, let me set the stage by giving you a little bit of background about A.J. and his career. Um, He's a double owl. He graduated um, from the undergraduate program in 1992. He graduated from the law school in 1996. He has been a partner at Reed Smith um, here in Philadelphia since 2004. And I think to get a sense of um, how successful he has been, it's helpful to see what has happened at Reed Smith in that time. Um, in 2004, Reed Smith was certainly a successful firm. As most of you know, it was a firm with a national presence, but based in Pennsylvania. Um, it was developing an international presence and was doing quite well. Profits for partner were, per partner were about $400,000, so they were not hurting. Um, AJ joined the firm as a junior partner at the time, expecting, I think, to develop a reasonable book of business. Um, but instead, due, I think, to his really unprecedented vision of how to innovate the practice of law, um, he, I think, has contributed to incredible growth at the firm. Um, part, profits per partner now are over a million dollars. Um, the firm has 23 offices around the world, 1,700 lawyers. Um, it is internationally recognized as one of the leading firms in the nation, uh, the BTI 30 service um, survey of general counsels um, around the world has recognized it for the last nine years as one of the very best law firms. Its brand is recognized internationally as being one of the top 20 law firm brands in the United States. Um, so the firm is hugely successful. And this has happened all while the economy and the market for legal services has changed drastically. So while other firms were shrinking or, in fact, failing, Reed Smith was succeeding, um, and, and succeeding significantly. Now, I'm highly confident that AJ's partners would agree that his presence alone didn't cause that to happen. That said, I think there is probably at least strong correlation. Um, why is that? Well, if you look at his bio online, you see a fellow with a pretty broad general business law practice. He does real estate. He does structured finance. He does international joint ventures, all sorts of things. Um, but I think the key to his success is in understanding that what really matters to clients is not how to get something done, which is, of course, what lawyers traditionally think we're supposed to do, but instead, why do the clients have the problems they have in the first place? And that ability to understand deeply what clients need is, I think, the thing that has set AJ apart and will form the basis of what we talk about. Um, Along the way, um, we'll talk about how it is that you can improve the value that you deliver, um, how you can develop your own path to success as a lawyer in a variety of professional settings, um, and how you can have fun doing it. So without further ado, let me welcome A.J. Raju. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, just to, I think, answer the first question that's probably on everybody's mind. Mm -hmm. How did you go about developing your practice? His practice, by the way, is, I believe, the largest in Reed Smith, all of Reed Smith. No, it's, 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 I would say it's been, it's one of the uh, top ten. But one of the right largest. Now, right now, who's counting, but right now, it's probably <laughs> num number third or so right now. But, uh, but there's so many great rainmakers in our firm. I'm just one among many. Very, very successful rainmaker in the firm. So how did you do this? How did you get there? Well, I think for me, uh, I didn't have the, the traditional background entering into law. I walked into law with a little bit of a jaundiced eye because when I came out, not expecting to practice law for a long time, 
I assumed, after looking at it for a while, that it was a huge conspiracy against the laity. Because uh, in many ways, this is the only profession where you get to give somebody a menu, they get to order things, and then they, can't, they don't know exactly what they're paying for it until the end of the meal. That's how law was practiced back then. And I also saw very little in terms of innovation, because one of the things that lawyers pride themselves is, you know, just like people who make sushi, this is exactly how we do it. There's a template formula to how they to practice law, and that's been like that for hundreds of years. Now, I challenged it not because of any foresight other than simply thinking that that can't be the only way to do it. And uh, I looked at what Walmarts of the world do with supply chain methodology, what uh, Zappos does with client satisfaction, and all the business logistics innovation that others were touting at the time, and thought, why not incorporate all of that into your practice? And by that I mean, I created back then what we called roughly Six Sigma model, trying to get from point A to point B as fast as possible, focusing on the client service and also focusing on what is the client trying to accomplish. And once you started doing that, you broke the old model of hourly rates because clients want you to fix something. They don't want to hear that it's going to be an hourly rate. I don't know exactly what it's going to cost. If you can build a high rise and give somebody a projected cost estimate, you know, with change orders, if you will, because things change, then you can tell somebody what their legal spend would be. So I started not out of any foresight other than just necessity, how to differentiate because I was a young punk and I was looking to cut my path into the world. Um, I came up with a flat fee, but today what we call alternative uh, fee schedule, because I had no other choice. That was the only way I competed. Uh, came up with a Six Sigma team. We sort of consistently stayed with the same team. The team that I've had since 2001 or so is essentially expanded, but it's the same model. We all do the work in a, in a way that takes advantage of the supply chain methodology. All of us know what everybody else is doing. For example, when you walk into a hospital, it's not the doctor who takes your uh, insurance card or uh, gives you a prescription or asks you the question. There are layers of people that do it. Our team is structured that way, too. There are different people with corresponding skill level, and all of them attack the patient, which is the client service that we're doing. And that layered structure, essentially what that means is what you could, today would be called legal process management. We needed to do that to sort of say, if we're going to have a flat fee out there, then I need to control the spend. I need to make sure that our team is as efficient as possible because it's on my dime now, no longer the client. Right? So we no longer can pass through inefficiency or, or, or lack of skill onto the client. Instead, the client has a specific expectation of what this will cost, quality not being compromised, because I think quality today is a commodity. Every large law firm has great lawyers. Right? So that's not what clients expect that. That's just the basics. What they want you to do is to think like they would. They want you to be part of them, think about the problems, look beyond the horizon, anticipate those issues. So I think that in the uh, early 2000s or so, uh, not, we weren't the only ones doing it, but I think it was a rare thing to do at that point because back then it was still the hourly rate model. The cost of the law firm was passed through in terms of you know, hourly rates just inching up and creeping up, whereas you know, I think the advantage I had in the beginning was the clients had a specific expectation. We have a 24-7 service mo uh, mantra. People that work understand they're in the service business. They're slaves, and they understand <laughs> it. And, and clients appreciate that. When you think like the client, clients think that you're one of them. So that's how I think in the beginning the seeds of that business started growing. And then a lot of it, quite frankly, uh, the professor was more of a uh, word of mouth. I think uh, I've yet to do an RFP with a client. The one client then calls somebody else, and then that has, that has bred more clients over the years. So what I think I'm hearing you say is that you were willing and able to think innovatively out of the box about how legal services were being delivered to clients in a way that most other folks weren't. And the key to that was really understanding the world from the perspective of the clients, both what they wanted and, in a sense, how they did what they did and emulating that in some ways. Yeah, I mean, I, I think with almost every one of my clients, I have a seat at the table with their executive team. Uh, I work with them. I don't think I've ever considered myself a lawyer. And I don't mean that to be disparaging to our profession. It's just that, as you in the introduction pointed out, I'm not in the what business. You know, somebody says, what do you do? It's a broad-based stuff. I mean, you know, 
for some clients, I'm the guy who sets up reservations because they can't get it on Friday night at a nice restaurant in Philly. <laughs> for somebody else, it could be, could you talk to uh, uh, the governor or the legislators because I think shale's going to be big. We want to we want to see it at the table. There could be policy shaping that happens. There could be uh, influence brokering that happens. For somebody, I may be a deodorant. You know, I make sure they don't stink or smell, right? <laughs> That's the typical legal work that you do, right? To make sure your clients don't get into trouble. For somebody else, it could be spotting what's beyond the horizon. If we're in the business today here, can we collectively sit around the round table, think about what's, let's vi do a visioning session and think about where's our business going? And once you're part of the team, then you're no longer just somebody who gets a call saying, we now have a problem, come solve it. But instead, you are anticipating problems and making sure that they never happen in the first place. And that's a huge, now, I've been lucky uh, uh, in many ways because I've had people, um, titans in the business world, who have allowed me to sit at their round table and, and many, on many occasions allowed me to stand on their shoulders and sort of get a peek at what's beyond the horizon. Now, I've had that vantage point. I've exploited it. I've taken advantage of it. And over the years, I hope I have also reciprocated in terms of returns to our clients. But you know, the loyalty has been great. And I'm loyal to them. They're loyal to us. One of the things that we try to talk about with our students here is yeah. how to be entrepreneurial about developing those relationships, that ultimately this is a relationship business. And therefore, you have to really think strategically about who you want to know, how you want to know them, and what that can then lead to. So how did you think about that when you were coming out of law school, when you were a young attorney? No, I don't know if it was uh, I ever specifically. One of the words that I am allergic to, and especially your generation uses it often, you know, I'm going to a networking event, network, network, network. And I get it. I understand how that works. But a lot of times, that's like shooting pellets in the dark, hoping to hit a target. I believe in strategic alliances. I've always believed in strategic alliances ever since I was a young guy. So if, if you connect, if a professor, you and I connect, there must be two or three things if we really got to know each other beyond the, you know, the cocktails and really get to know each other. I bet you there are about two or three things where we have a shared passion for. And if both of us were committed to saying, let's align ourselves and work towards that shared goal, it's easier for the two of us to do it together than for me to do it solo. That has been sort of the philosophy for me from day one, ever since I was a 14-year-old kid. You know, you find somebody, and you see in their eyes a shared passion, and then you say, let's gang up. All right, let's recruit more. You know, you've seen the movie Dirty Dozen. You know, you start with one, and then you get somebody with the holster, and then you get the second guy. By the time you're done, you have 12 people with guns, and you take on the bad guys, right? So that was the same logic. So for me, uh, it has always been the strategic alliances that you have built along the way uh, that sort of sustains a long-term career as opposed to networking. Networking, you know, if you go into an event hoping to meet somebody and uh, you know, there's a good chance the person you really want to meet is about 18 steps away, and you will never run into that person. But the person you met today, you can't get anything good out of them today, but maybe it's about four years from now, it would have been good to connect with. By that time, you've lost the card. There is no reason, there's no relationship glue there, right? The relationship glue happens when you are sort of invested in the other person, and that person is invested back in you. And that's a shared dance. It doesn't happen. Uh, automatically, it's, it's a process. And you have to, you know, some of the best rainmakers um, are those who sort of plant seeds, and they don't, after the planting seed, they don't just stare at the soil waiting for the flower to pop up. They go around planting seeds everywhere, doing the good, good work, and then about a year or two later, they're tending gardens everywhere. And I think that, that if you don't worry about the immediate return on that investment, but it's a long term investment, you know, you're going to tend a huge garden. Which is great advice. Um, so it sounds like what you do is pretty fun. Like most, I think, law students think, well, if I go to work at a big law firm, you know, I'm going to be a grunt. I'm going to be grinding through lots of stuff. It's going to be, you know, a lot of work. If I don't go to a big firm, it'll still be a lot of work. It's, you know, it's hard. Not, being a lawyer is not easy. But somehow you've made it sound like it's actually fun. <laughs> well, it is fun. I get to solve some of the most. Uh pressing problems for some of the most important clients around the world. And uh, you get to get called in and parachute down and solve someone's problem. You get to, you get to start dreaming about their vision and anticipate next steps that they were going to be doing. You know, it's, it's opportunity exploitation, risk assessment, mitigating problems afterwards. All of that is fun. So when you focus on the day-to-day, -day, 
you know, that's when you start thinking, you know, what am I doing? So I, when I was younger, uh, I went to the circus, and they, at the circus with my grandfather, there, there's this massive elephant. Next to the elephant uh, is, a, is a wooden stake. Not a metal stake, just a wooden stake. So I asked my grandfather, why is it that that elephant, probably the same beast that stretched the tent into shape the night before, the most powerful creature under that tent, why is it that it can stand there so still without you know, any sense of panic when all the kids and all this noise is happening around, them, around it? Well, the answer was because when it was a young calf, it was tied to a metal stake, and as much as it tried, it got conditioned into thinking that as long as there's a stake next to you, you can't do much, right? Well, that conditioning is with all of us. We all have a stake next to us, and usually that happens because people who love us the most say, don't jump, don't run, don't do this, don't do that. So we get conditioned to thinking, if you're a lawyer, you're only, your job is only to provide labor, and law, labor law advice and nothing else. You can't think outside the box. If you are an IP lawyer, this is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to fit a role because the state tells you what not to do, right? By the way, that's a fake story, but I use that, <laughs> I use that really to explain to, explain to my team. But I, you, if I started by saying it was a fake story, you would say, ah, you know, I'm going to tune off. But it is a fake story. I was, it never happened to me. But I use it to illustrate, <laughs> illustrate the point that we all get conditioned into thinking. So you ask the question, well, how do you make it fun? So at that same fake story, behind the elephant was this guy whistling. Um, and his job was with this big bucket, every time the elephant will do his business, you know, his job was to clean it up, right? Probably the most demeaning job in the world. So in that fake story, I walk up to the man, I say, this is the most demeaning job in the world, and you're whistling and you're having so much fun, right? And his response was, when I asked him, don't you feel like just giving this up and quitting and just running and doing something more meaningful? Well, it's not so demeaning. And his, his response was, and what, give up show business? <laughs> so I look at law, unlike I have to do a brief or I have to do a document, I look at it as I'm part of a billion-dollar law firm, 24 offices around the world, solving some of the biggest companies' most pressing problems, things that people in our hallways do and advise on matters to billions of people around the world. And that is show business. So... Why would I ever give up show business? Why would you give up show business? Yeah. Right. Um, I want to go back to something that you were talking about earlier. Um, you mentioned the Six Sigma idea, yeah. how part of what you were innovating wasn't only thinking about how to approach clients and their problems, but also thinking about how to effectively solve them and do so in a way that was more efficient for them. Um, law schools don't currently teach Six Sigma, so these folks may not know what that is. Can you just break that down a little bit more for, for these guys? Yeah, so for, for example, so if you're doing any, any project, you know, if your project management matters, right? So in a typical law firm model, especially in the old days, uh, when I say old days, five, seven, eight years ago, um, the, if the business model was that the more hours you bill, the fatter your bill is, the incentive was built in on an hourly rate structure to not focus on efficiency. Now, you, you focused on efficiency because you were honest and you cared about your clients and you wanted to make sure that what the product you gave came at the best possible price. But if you take that factor of, am I going to be honest or is the firm going to be honest, right? And if you say, now it's on your dime, well, guess what? If it's in your dime, you're going to find out the most efficient route. Well, I, what I call the Six Sigma, it's a quasi Six Sigma, not formal, but it's what I just called it. Um, is really trying to go from A to B in the most efficient manner and use people. So instead, a partner, so, you know, you, you see in, in firms where if an assistant is out, a paralegal is out, you see the partner at 600, 800 bucks per hour, you know, filling out the working party list and marking up documents and doing things. For me, all what I consider administrative tasks that don't have a bearing on legal judgment or value ought to be pushed down to those who are at the lowest possible rate, right? because as long as it doesn't risk the quality of the advice that I'm giving, push down to the lowest person. That's why when I use the hospital analogy, when the patient comes in, you don't need uh, the, the high-paying cardiologist to walk in and take the insurance card, walk him and ask him about the medical history, fill out the chart, 
All of that is done by different layers of people with their corresponding skill levels and the rates. And by the time the patient is lying there, there is already now that doctor is then, or a lawyer in this case, in terms of the work, is providing the most appropriate level of skill, right, for the right dollars. Second, the reason why we have, so if you send an email to my team, uh, they're different uh, D-lists, but if you send it to all Bracadia team, that's for our you know, great client Bracadia that we do work for, there are about 14 of us who handle 100% uh, all day long work for that client. Um, when you send an email to all Bracadia team, it goes to all 14. Right? So that may seem at first glance inefficient when a new matter comes in, 14 people get an email. But when they get that email, it's like the patient walking into the hospital. Different people immediately jump on. Somebody opens up a client matter. Or somebody opens up. Now, we have somebody sitting at conflicts department that gets us a matter number within half hour. Now, why is that important? Because if you promise them 24-hour turnaround time, and if you're waiting for two days to get the conflicts cleared, any of the matters coming up, well, you have just breached your promise. So it's creating that built-in system in place so that when the patient's lying there, different people with masks have different roles and they know exactly what to do. There's quality control, there's efficiency, and you also don't, there's no redundancy of effort, there's no duplication of effort, and you also make sure that the best and the most quality people are not strung up with administrative tests, but instead they can spend as much time as possible. So when our lawyers, when they're on the phone with uh, our client, uh, Professor Lipson, I'm not worried about if you want to talk about the weekend and because that's also relationship building. Sometimes finding out what's happened to you and what your mood is today could, be bear, could bear on the work that we're doing. We can spend as much time as possible. There is no clock running. It's on me. It's, I save my money on the efficiency that we, pre we create our, by creating the right team, doing all the right work. And that's the same thing. Look, if you go to Walmart, you, Walmart knows exactly where a can of soup is at any given point. By the time it goes from the truck all the way to when it goes in the parking lot in the hands of the consumer. Entire 14 of us, if you just look at the Bracadia client relationship, they all know where the can of soup is at any given point. And if Dr. Raju is speaking with Professor Lipson, right now business is as usual because there's a chart next to the deal. Somebody else, Dr. Braden or Dr. Coach, looks at the, looks at the chart and says, oh, this is penicillin, no problem, and the patient goes off. Right? So there's no interruption. So that's what I mean by Six Sigma, creating that system project management efficiency protocols so that everybody knows exactly what to do and nothing slips through the cracks. So, so this is great. So this raises for me two questions. Mm -hmm. um, the first, um, and in some ways easier one, is about management mm -hmm. skills. Right? One of the things we also don't teach in law school is how to manage other people. And it sounds like part of the key to succeeding in this way, implementing this innovative approach to solving legal problems, is understanding how to manage people. If you had to sort of, if you had to advise somebody how to think about managing people, for example, young lawyers who are going to have to manage either lawyers more junior to them or paralegals or whatever, um, what are some of the things that you've learned as a manager that really seem to matter? Well, I've learned a couple of things. Um, one, for me, I think leadership is a calling. I, I firmly believe that as corny as that sounds, I, I do believe that. Um, I think I do have a good gift at spotting someone's talent. If I see them this tall, but their expectation is to be this tall, I think I feel as though that is my calling to help them bridge the gap between their current status and what the real potential is. So elasticity of imagination and meeting somebody is what I think I have. I probably don't have it, but I, you know, humor me. <laughs> um, but second, I think, is... You uh, make up great stories, so I do make your up imagination is very sound. I, I, I do make up good stories. But the second thing is, I think, I think of the best leaders that I've seen, um, and I have a very narrow strength as a leader. I don't think I'm as good as a manager as I could be, but it's intentional. Um, and I'll get to it in a second. I think the best leaders don't tell somebody else what the vision is, but they invite the person to stand next to you and see for themselves what the vision is, right? Because you have to have skin in the game. You have to encourage and inspire them to sort of walk with you. For me, I consider myself a Phil Jackson kind of a leader. It's easy to win when you're surrounded by Kobe or Michael Jordan. And I only work with, so I do uh, very selfishly, you know, I love everybody, but I love the 1% most. <laughs> by 1%, I mean the people who instinctively already have that Kobe gene or a Michael Jordan gene. So I work with the best. So it's easy to have a couple of wins because the team around you are snipers. 
and, um, and you get to take credit for what they already bring to the table ahead of time, the same level of passion, the same level of skill set, the same level of elasticity of imagination that you would want somebody at. Now, if I was a unselfish manager, I would also work with you know, some of the bench players that we don't know about, right? But I don't do that. I'm, you know, I intentionally, because, um, uh, because I do think that, especially at work, now I do a lot of it on the charity side, I do a lot of the nonprofit side, where I work with the rest of the 99%. But I, selfishly at work, I only like to work with the 1%. And you don't have to do much to manage the 1%. They manage themselves. If you've chosen the right 1%, they can manage yeah. the rest. So the second question that raises, or this sort of whole idea of innovating in this pretty radical way, raises is the following, since we're talking about show mm -hmm. business. Imagine that I am a senior partner at Reed Smith in 2004, and along comes young AJ Reju with this radical new vision about how to do business. And it is taking away my billable hour, and it's taking away my very you know, thick layer of mid-level associates who bill in a way that enables me to enjoy the lifestyle to which I've become accustomed. And I have no idea whether your model will succeed. All I know is that I'm in an industry that has trained me for 40 years to never, ever, ever do anything differently than anybody before me did. What kind of resistance did you encounter, and how did you manage that? Look, I think when I first got into the firm, um, I don't think mid-level associates and others were jumping to do work on my projects. Not because they didn't like me, that's because, you know, as a young guy, um, just joined the firm, I was an associate at Morgan Lewis. On Friday, Monday, I was a partner at Reed Smith, so I walked into Reed Smith as a partner. Um, so obviously, untested, unproven, I had a book of business, I had a client, but, you know, they don't know that. I brought with me my assistant from Morgan Lewis, and I also called, at that point, you know, one of my buddies, because when I first walked in, I had to do everything. I was the CEO, I was also the janitor, I was everything. Uh, and I was working nonstop. You know, you ever seen the gong show? Some of you are too young, but, you know, where you had the Jackson 5, it was just one guy and then four, four puppets, you know, and then he would do the dance. That was me. It was, we looked for the outside world that we had five or six people doing it, but it was just one person doing everything along with Nancy, who passed away. Um, but Nancy and I built the practice at the time, because one, at that and I don't blame them. That was an unproven commodity, you know, somebody untested. So what I did, the great tribute to Reed Smith, is a firm of entrepreneurs. It embraces entrepreneurs and it sort of provides that opportunity. If you have a good business model and if you want to um, uh, come up and create a new model, Reed Smith is exactly the kind of firm that says, we're going to provide you as much support as possible. The management, even though it was an untested commodity, management gave me a lot of room. Okay, the rubber band had a lot of elasticity when I walked in there. And what that gave me, what that, what I, but practically what that meant was, I went out and hired my own people. The first guy that I hired was Rob Davis. Rob Davis was uh, our running back when I played football at George Washington High School. I called him because I trusted him. Didn't have legal background. He was not a paralegal. I needed somebody that I trusted to call him over. So Rob and I come in and he says, what, what are we trying to do? And we figured it out. Afterwards, was it that whole dirty dozen recruitment? After Rob came Ranjish Gopinathan, you know, and then a long list of people. We, we have a hall of fame of all these people who have helped build our little practice and moved on. But we recruited each one for their skill set, for their loyalty, that 1% that we already knew existed. And that's how we did it. So in the beginning, and even today, you know, I hire differently than I think most people because I specifically look for different types of not career path folks. Most of the people we hire, especially are non-lawyers, which we have a lot of, are people who have high GPAs uh, coming out of their undergrads. They know they want to go to law school or they want to go to business school. You know, uh, and I make them work like sweatshop hours for about two years, and in return, I give them lifelong loyalty. And most of them come back and work, uh, come back to our team, and some of them become clients or some of them become great friends. But that's, that's been, that was the model, so we built it the resistance wasn't that much. And if it was a firm, uh, now in the beginning when I first walked up to the IT department, I said, I need a D-list. I wanted to call you know, all defeasance team. And they said, no, no, we can't just, because everybody will have D-list. It's so too much to manage. Explain what that is. D-list is where you have 14 people in the email. So then instead of sending out to Professor Lipson and, and John and, and, and Kathy, you just sort of have everybody under just you know, uh, T 
Team Lipson. And everybody gets the same email. Something simple as that creates, because if everybody asked for it, it creates a headache. I went up to the conflicts department and I said, I need, because we do so much volume, I need somebody dedicated uh, to make sure that they immediately process our stuff because we have the Six Sigma model where we say within an hour we have response on emails, within 24 hours we'll turn around documents. That was our promise to the clients. Well, the firm obviously accommodated that. So the firm went, you know, they bent over backwards. So in many ways, you know, I was just the right time, the right place, definitely the right firm that gave me that. So Jim Petraglia, the conflicts department, all of these guys, you know, get to touch the ball. Now I get to take the credit for all their great work, but you know, all of them put together created that Six Sigma model. You know, some of them are still with us, some of them moved on as clients, some of them you know, uh, are, are coming back and joining us later. So it's a collective thing, but I think the firm was helpful. There was definitely a learning curve. In the beginning, I think, I'm, even today, I think some people think I'm, I have radical thoughts, uh, uh, and I probably do. I, I, I think the way we practice law today, and the next 10 years when we look back, it's going to be sea change. When I graduated from law school in 1996, the way we practiced law was different. We didn't have 1996, the Telecom Act gets enacted, emails just become, like imagine back then we would do FedExes and UPSs. You know, you would send out this fiery letter to somebody in a FedEx, and they'll get it two days later, and you're sitting there seething, waiting for their response, you know. It was not like getting ready for the cannon, waiting, oh, I'll wait till they get here, I'm going to shoot them. It was it was like civil war back then, you know. It was you do FedEx, and today, by the time you hit send, you know you're getting a bullet right back at you because you know they're coming back with a fire shot immediately with a response, and you have to go faster. It's fast the way we practice today. In ten years, social media and social networking will transform. So what we saw back in 1996, from going from analog to digital, that was one revolution, and the young people back then who sort of saw the trend and were savvy about managing that change were the ones who rode the wave the best. Today, a lot of things are happening. 2008, the new normal, great recession. No longer can you hide behind hourly rate model. Clients today have general counsel that used to be partners at law firms. They know exactly how the sausage is made. They want value. They just don't want, they want you to take the risk. They don't want to pay for associate training. They want to know, I'm paying for this, what am I getting in return? Completely changed. Industry has changed. You have legal process outsourcing companies, accounting firms, private equity firms, everybody encroaching at us, right? You have smaller firms that are uh, you know, biting at our heels. So you have to change. The students at Temple and those of, of your age and you know, who, uh, your experience, I think are the ones in the next 10 years who will transform the way we do business, not because you guys are smarter than we, we were or just because it was the right opportunity. Right? Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and others were born at the right time when the right change was happening. The Steve Jobs of law firms, law firm business, is just going to law school right now. And they're going to walk in with no expectations of what law used to be or what business used to be. They're going to transform it because they swim differently. Right? One last metaphor. If you ask my dad to go, uh, uh, and who's sitting over there, uh, go navigate the DVR, right? it'll be... It'll be difficult because now he can do it because he's an intelligent man, but he doesn't want to do it. He doesn't immediately <laughs> embrace it. If you ask my uh, six-year-old when he was three, he just instinctively figured out. Right? We had we have computers back then, in around the 80s, that were massive, and it took a rocket scientist to sort of figure out exactly how to work them. Today, a three-year-old immediately does all of these functionalities with computers that are simpler and smaller. So what has changed? Have the people changed or the technology easier? Right? So what, is, what, will, what has changed between what we were able to do as lawyers back in the 90s when we could only manage a handful of cases at a time, but today summer associates or young associates are managing 20, 30, getting calls from everywhere because they're faster. They're mutated. They're efficient. They're faster. They're stronger. And they think in 100 miles per hour speed, unlike what we were, because you have to adapt. And the next evolution of change is happening all around us. And the, the next leaders who will transform an entire industry are somewhere watching this, I think. So the Steve Jobs analogy is yeah. great because you know, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, they started in a garage. Mm -hmm. right? They didn't start at, I mean, they had some help from Hewlett Packard, but you know, they didn't start in the equivalent of a large law firm. 
And the new normal in part means that large law firms aren't hiring as many associates out of law schools as they used to. And it's unrealistic unreal to expect that that will change. Um, so given that we have more and more students who are going to come out of law school needing to think more creatively, more aggressively about how to innovate in ways that will create value for them and their clients, what sorts of opportunities do you see for them? How should they, if they're in the garage tinkering with the legal equivalent of you know, the Apple One, what should they be well, look, I think thinking about? How should they do it? One of the great things about Steve Jobs and Apple as a company is that they were not in the what business as we started this conversation. And they were definitely in the why business. So when you think about Apple, you don't think computers, you don't think music, you don't think, you know, you don't, you don't think at all. You just think uh, as a company that is built on innovation. They take whatever it is, they take their sunglasses, if that's going to be their next business model, and you'll buy it, you'll stand in line, because <laughs> it's Apple. You know that they'll make it cooler, they'll make it more user-friendly, and you'll want it because it's Apple. They're in the why business. So you, why do you want to do business with Apple? Because they're the most innovative. They're, you know, that's what you think, and that's what you want, and that's what you get when you work with them. But if you're in the business of you know, nothing against Dell or other companies, you know, you're expecting computers. If they come up with a falafel tomorrow, you're not going to want it. But an <laughs> Apple falafel, you may stand in line for. So, so I, think, I think today, the business, now back then, no, who would have thought back then when Steve comes in, Steve Jobs um, uh, comes up with a computer that was multicolored, you know, who would have thought that would actually, you know, other than teenage girl thinking that that's, that's kind of cool, who would have thought you would be buying that? He was a visionary. He anticipated the needs of the consumer before the consumer even recognized what the needs were. And the innovative students today who think that the model is simply, I have to work for a large firm, that's the only path to success, right? I have to make this computer, it has to look a certain way, are the, you know, the Dells of the world. And there's nothing wrong with that. Dell's a great company. Um, and there are many companies who do the what really well. And you can do that. That's the path. Or you can say, I don't know where my path will be, but I can innovate. And, and then you say, well, that's difficult. How many times? Well, I can't give all my secrets, but I will use this metaphor. You know, if you look at a pocket square, there are only 20 ways, probably, that you can innovate on a pocket square. I mean, you can sort of get silk or cotton. You know, you can get stripes, color changes. There are different things that you can do with a pocket square to be innovative. But after a while, after the 20th time, people go, well, they all look the same. True, except for the guy who thought, why should it be square in the first place? Why can't it be a pocket round? Right? And this was innovation, because for years, it was always a pocket square. The guy who came up and just challenged the whole notion of, does it even have to be a square? Why can't it be a round? That is going to be the next generation of innovation. I mean, if you just come in and and say, look, I'm going to create the same model. Uh, and the model is my grandfather or the person I watched on TV or LA Law or whatever the new show is or for lawyers, suits. You know, I want to be that person. No, well, you're going to be a carbon copy of what you think success is. But if you sit down and you say, I'm a hub of influence, I'm going to be the why for that person, right? So I always say in our business, you want to be the AC Cowan in our business. Now, who's A.C. Cowan? If you're O.J. Simpson and you find yourself in a white Bronco chased by all the media, <laughs> uh, you want A.C. Cowan to drive that white Bronco, right? And that's A.C. Cowan. If your client is in trouble, if you're not one of the first two or three people that they call, and if you're not there, A.C. Cowan, then, you know, then anybody can do the work uh, that they wanted the problem to be solved, to be done, right? Because everybody can do it. You want to be one handful of people that can solve problems and where people go, that's our go-to person. He or she can do things that others can't. Now you have license to feel comfortable for the rest of your life because you're wanted. You want to be wanted. So, and I think that what's really valuable and transferable in this is that you are thinking about why the client exists, why the client wants to do what it does, and the client develops confidence in you because you have shown that you have, in effect, stepped into their Choose, and so they know that you naturally understand their problem better than anybody else does. Fair way to care Look, for I mean, I, I mean, if you look at my posture, this sort of the sure-footedness and almost borderline arrogance and cockiness in the way I'm sitting right now. So don't confuse. I mean, I don't have any of the answers. I think I have a process. 
Uh, I am sure-footed. Sometimes I can be confused for anything more than confidence. Um, but, but what I'm suggesting, and I, you know, just for a second I had an out-of-body experience thinking, who the hell are you to tell everybody else uh, what all of this is? So just bear with me. I you were invited just... to do that. That's okay. okay. <laughs> so a disclaimer. Let me talk about Vikram Dewan to your question, to answer your question. Vikram runs the Philadelphia Zoo. Vic and I were talking about enterprise risk management. And I said, Vic, what keeps you up at night? Uh, and he said, you know, if we have a bad year. So if you're the Philadelphia Zoo, there are certain days, and if you don't have a good day, meaning torrential rain, poor on an Easter Sunday, for example, right, as a huge revenue loss for the zoo. That's an enterprise risk that they have to worry about. So Vic had to figure out how to insure against that. So he called his law firm, accounting firm, insurance broker, and told them the same problem. Hey, we, there are about eight or 10 days that are must-have days for the zoo, and we have to make sure that the right public comes in. If we miss those days, that whole year's budget is gone. Now, Vic is a smart guy. Unlike most nonprofit executives who worry about endowment, you know, who pretend to be birds with clipped wings and always looking for need, Vic <laughs> knows that earned income is the way to go. Earned income because if you're a nonprofit, a dollar is a dollar. If you're Reed Smith, a dollar is 70 cents. So he knows there's incentive now to build the earned income. So with that in mind, he said, how do I protect my backside in here to make sure that bad days, if there were downpours, that I'm still protected? He wanted an insurance product. The law firm prepares a memo. Accounting firm says, you know, this is not my problem. I don't think we can do it. But if you get it, if there are any tax issues, we will deal with it. And then he goes to, remember, these are all his AC Cowlings at the time. Uh, and then he goes to the insurance broker, who obviously is the company that he's going and saying, I need an insurance product, cover this risk. The insurance broker comes back and says, look, there is no insurance product for this. We can't give you a product. But we sat around and huddled uh, with each other. And we think what you really need is not an insurance product, but a derivative product, essentially a over and under bet. Two people get on both sides of the contract. One bets that 50 days it'll rain. The other bet says, you know, no, it'll be less than, or other says more than. And there's a hedge on, on that bet. And that's a contract out there. They pay in if one is right, the other one is wrong. It was a out-of-the-box creative thinker who came in with that product. Now, the insurance broker didn't make a dime out of that deal. It was an innovative solution, right? So when a client comes in and, and asks you for a solution, sometimes you're not the right person to deliver that solution, but you still think about their problem. You embrace it as though it's your problem. The insurance broker will forever be Vic's AC Cowling, whether it's a legal issue or anything. If he's thinking about anything big in terms of the Philadelphia Zoo, guess who is a thought leader that always has the first phone call you know, placed? the insurance broker. Right? We want to be that insurance broker to all of our clients. because Not because we're looking to maximize the legal fees or the legal spend, but there's a problem. Whether we are the right people to solve it or not, it's not the issue. Maybe we are the right people to direct them to the right folks, or we tell them it's not a legal issue. This is much more of a bigger issue. Uh, maybe it's a policy issue, a lobby issue, whatever it is. But I think if you're an honest broker and you inherit the client's problem as your own, uh, and you think with elasticity, not just where the horizon is, but if you have the ability to peek beyond the horizon, that's the, that, that's the person that the client cannot live without. That's super helpful. I, I'm sure that the folks in the audience have some questions, but before yep. we turn to them, you can easily imagine that the law school, like every law school in the nation, is thinking a lot about innovation. How can we adapt what we do in this building to enable our students to be more competitive, more effective in you know, sort of the ways you have already been? Um, obviously, it's been a while since you've been in law school, and so I don't expect you to you know, know anything in particular about what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. But if you were thinking about what law schools should be doing, if you're thinking out of the box about how can we innovate in a law school in, such that we're going to produce lawyers who themselves are more innovative, more entrepreneurial, more efficient. Um, what sorts of things should we be doing? Make sure they're not aware of the, what's tying up, up at the ankle, right? Uh, the wooden stake. Because 
every law student walks in and says, what do you want to be? They start thinking about, I want to be a litigator, or I want to be a transactional guy. I want to be a labor lawyer, or I want to be a contract lawyer. To me, that's the worst thing. Uh, now, they may end up being that. That could be the title, but that's not, that doesn't limit you. That doesn't define you. That's just one of your many roles that you play. Uh, make sure you explain to them that there are no boundaries. Boundaries can be reimagined. We can kick and keep extending and stretching the boundaries. So today, the model is this. Tomorrow, it may be something else, because we don't even know what's around the corner. But be prepared for it. What I think what best law schools do, and I think Temple is one of the best at it, is it prepares the students to think for themselves. And also, Temple is not a cocoon where you have carbon copy of the same people, you know, same, same type of student, same ethnic background or same uh, you know, status in, in society in terms of wealth. Different people, first careers, second careers, you know, right out of undergrad, some people right out of uh, you know, cops and doctors, and they all come in. That's Temple. It's a melting pot of practical ideas where impossible only looks possible. So the words I am, usually we have blinders on at Temple. Why? Because you have to be that type of person to go to a place like Temple where such diversity exists. So there is no template to walk into Temple. So when you walk out, don't walk out with a template of what you expect uh, at the law firm and a law, uh, law school or post-law school career should be. You walk in with an open mind and you say, I will look at opportunities and then I will decide how to do it. What I walk away with is an arsenal of tools, how to deal with issues, not only as a lawyer, as a private equity, uh, a venture capitalist, as a dentist, as a doctor. It's just thinking about how to, how to solve the problem. Once you don't have those limitations, that person is, you know, and I know it's abstract, but, but you have to, when the opportunity comes in front of you, then you have to think about how to do it right. Strategic alliances help. Sometimes you can't do it on your own. The friends you make at Temple today, maybe the uh, Wozniak and, 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 the, and the Jobs combination, right? Uh, you know, the people that you sit around and huddle with, uh, go to classes with, together, you may be making a product or a new way of thinking about law, or you may, you'll make history together because it's easier to, easier to hunt in packs. So make alliances, work with people who are stronger, um, and think differently. You know, don't define yourself just because the template ha was the old way, just because it has to be a square to have a pocket, to be inside a pocket. No, just challenge the question itself, and I think everything will be fine. Ask why. Ask why. Um, this is terrific, AJ. Sure. Why don't we open it up for questions now? Easy questions only, please. Easy questions only. Chris? Thank you uh, very much for coming and speaking with us today. Uh, as you were talking about innovation, um, I, I kept wondering, you know, as you're developing these new business models, developing these new, new ways of thinking about uh, old products or, or old services, uh, there has to be some type of a uh, adaptation uh, cost, right? So how, as you're bringing these new ideas um, to market, uh, do you limit the, the possible downside risk uh, to, to the client and, and to the brand that you're using to bring these new things? Look, I mean, I think innovation doesn't have to be expensive. Sometimes innovation actually tackles the cost issue up front, right? So everything we talked about eliminated the cost issue for the client because before they paid an amount that they didn't know what they were going to pay in the beginning. Now they have certainty. So all the things we've talked about actually. Now there are also things that if I had it my way, every law firm would have an R&D center, right? Research and development center. Not because they're in the business of telling the clients or industries where the law is going, where the regulatory world is evolving, but just because they should be thinking about the Goldman Sachs as meteorologists uh, not because the executives want to know whether it's raining today, but because they're in the futures business and the weather patterns matter for the advice that they give. So we should also have, as law firms and others, R&D centers where we're looking at where the evolution of law is. So just to take that expense, for example, 2008 happens. What we saw, the regulatory environment pre-2008, right, completely changed post-2008. Imagine a law firm that had a R&D center that had regulatory lawyers who know ins and outs of the financial regulatory world. Imagine them going on loan 
with the loan, origination, loan originators at the financial services that we, companies that, uh, you know, that law firm provides advice to. Imagine them now sitting immediately as the world is changing, coming up with new products that are exactly compliant with the new laws that are coming out that are this thick of compliance, right? So that gap of two years doesn't have to happen because you're immediately pivoting and changing. Instead of an hourly rate model, if I struck a deal with you saying we will immediately eliminate potential loss, loss, uh, lawsuit risk, a lack of compliance risk, and we'll come up with a product that meets the new world off the gate, would you give me 25% or 30% of that business? Right? That would be 10 or 20 billion maybe. Right? If, our, if we're a billion dollar firm, that could overnight change it. Now that's an investment. You're sending out your best people on loan with your best clients coming up with a new product that may or may not have an end return. But, uh, but that's an innovative thought. Uh, and that, doesn't, that costs money to some extent up front in the beginning. But over time, I think if you're prepared as a firm or as a business or as an individual, you know, I'm not speaking from a large law firm perspective, but there are people who will walk in and uh, who change lives uh, doing public interest work. You can, do, you can do work, meaningful work, substantial work, changing one household at a time. Or you can come up with a policy initiative or be a champion, right, and change the lives of millions and neighborhoods. So it depends on what your thought is, how you brand that how you anticipate those problems and come up with an innovative model that has more stamina for the long haul. So it doesn't always have to be expensive to be innovative. Let me jump in here, use my no. moderator's prior. Yes. Um, the idea of a research and development center in law firms is interesting. It's really fascinating. Um, and of course, when I hear the word research being an academic, I think, oh, well, that's something that law professors could do. Um, but really, more generally, as you think about something like that, who would staff it? Is it just lawyers? Is it people with non-legal degrees, people with PhDs, people with MBAs? Um, are non-traditional professional skills, non-legal non skills, increasingly going to be valuable for the folks in that R&D center, or even more generally to your, your practice? Look, 60% of my 60% of my team um, doesn't have a law degree. Uh, and so to me, I, uh, this is the wrong thing to be saying when you've invited me, said such nice things about me. But, but law degree matters, but you know, their talent is everywhere, regardless of degree. Now, I also believe the same people with a law degree can come up with a talent and be that person that doesn't have a law degree but that brings that skill because they think differently. So it's not as much, it's how you think, what we churn out. It's not the degree that matters to, be, to me. It's whether or not the person who walks out knows how to think differently and is as the ability to provide that value. So it doesn't, it doesn't it, it's great if you have a bunch of lawyers manning that station because they're the ones who already understand uh, the system, they understand the clients, they, understand, they have a training for a certain type of work. Clearly they would have a leg up, but if they are restricted in their thought and they only think this way, the world looks analog to them, not digital, then, but then you'll never see the change that you're hoping to see. So at that point, yeah, I would, I would not limit it only because I don't know what I'm getting. I just want the 1%. If a law degree, that's 0.05%, right? So that's great. If you don't have it, that's okay too. We'll work with you as long as you're the 1%. Okay. Other questions? Richard? Uh, hey, Richard. Uh, thanks again for coming uh, today to speak with us. Um, you spoke about how, um, you know, clients, at least financially speaking, clearly they're receptive to the sort of new change in the model. Um, but I was wondering, what was some of the actual feedback that you got when you presented them with this? Um, what were the things they were saying that they liked, um, things that they noticed that were different from how the old ways were? Um, right, so, so when I started doing, the, you know, I've never, when I started coming out, I didn't really have hourly rate model, it was all fixed fee. I wasn't the only guy doing it. There were a lot of other people doing it, but that was not the majority view. Majority of the people, I would say 95 or 90 percent of the way we did business back then, early 2000s, you know, it was an hourly rate structure. I would say still a large, vast majority of the way we practice today is still hourly rate structure. 
what we call alternative fees, sometimes a euphemism for discounts. It's not really the flat fee or arrangement. It's, you know, blended rates and all. There are different models for it, but you can call it what you want to call it, but it's, not, it's a conversation with the client that you're having. If the client has, most companies have budgets for things. They have anticipated costs. If you're going to go and ask a contractor to build a new house for you, you have a general sense of what it should cost based on what other houses were built for, right? And what the construction costs are, whether it's a brutal winter or not, whether union problems are going to be there or not. So you can sort of anticipate 18 other problems and sort of say, it should be in the range of 100000 to 200000 you should build. Now you, that's the bar that you're negotiating. Instead of saying, well, let's just see what happens, and I'll just get your bill at the end. So clients, of course, want certainty of cost. As long as they know, okay, I've just given you 100000 you're not just going to give me the Taj Mahal in Atlantic City. I was hoping for the Taj Mahal in Agra, right? <laughs> as long as the quality is great, which, again, is, you can't negotiate that. You can't compromise that. Quality has to be the best because if you uh, cheat a client out of quality the first time, that's the only time you're going to get that opportunity. They won't come back to you because there's so many choices of great quality lawyers out there. That's become a commodity now, right? So becoming a great lawyer is no longer the, uh, you know, the, the big prize. Everybody's going to become a great lawyer because law schools have gotten better and better at training and firms are becoming better and better and the types of work that you do is better. So that, what is the rest of it is the certainty of cost, efficiency, willingness to think about their problems beyond just solving it, beyond just being a deodorant for them, thinking about you know, what, what else is out there, all of that you know, matters, but, but, but to, to the narrow answer to your question is, you know, nobody, you know, rejects a certainty of cost. They embrace it. They want to know that. So you speak their language and they'll, of course, embrace you. Uh, JD, hello. MBA, both, yes. right? Combination. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, as the pace of innovation continues to increase at an exponential rate, uh, do you see big law firms at a disadvantage in terms of organi organizational inertia in order to change their path of thinking and their ways of doing business? Great question. I think there are two, two ways of looking at it. Right? Uh, large animals move slow, partly because they're confident. You know, they can take their time. Right? Um, it's the smaller animal that has to be jittery and, you know, and move faster. So if you're smaller, you're more nimble. You can do more things. So yes, the advantage is for small because for large tanker, it takes a long time to have organizational change and to sort of keep up with the pace and rapidity of it. But a large animal also has scale. And if it wants to move, it can move a tree, whereas it takes 13 right, gophers to sort of move that tree, you know, at least push the tree. You can't move it, but an elephant can move it overnight. So you have scale and you have power and you have uh, you have an ability to make immediate change if it comes from the top and that is part of your culture of innovation. And if you constantly say, we want to not have change for the sake of change, but constantly reevaluate the best and sort of say, we're going to exfoliate our ideas. All dead skin will be exfoliated. Old, old way of thinking will be exfoliated just because we do it on a regular basis. If you have that culture there, then you can have immediate, nimble facility as an organization. And if you don't have that, when it takes a long time to build up consensus in order to just have minimal change, that's what I think most large law firms have, that kind of a culture, then it's harder for them to innovate. That's why you haven't seen much in terms of innovation, in terms of how law firms, as opposed to companies like technology companies and others, law firms for the most part look the same. Technology companies today look different than what they did in 1996, and they will look different in 2015, or they'll look different in 2018, because they are, you're expected to constantly evolve, right? Uh, back in the old days, when I first came out, the cell phones were this big, you know, yeah, so it was kind of cool to walk around with that. Uh, today, they're so small that you can't even see them there, and your glasses, I mean, it's gone from the opposite to new. Uh, and law, I think, will change that way, too, and I think it could be you with your JD MBA that does it. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I think we have time for one more question. Okay. Thank you, AJ, for coming to talk to us today. Thanks for having me. Um, I really liked your metaphors and analogies and your answers, so I'm going to use one in my question. Sure. Uh, LeBron James 
before he ever became the best player in the NBA uh, and won two championships, he lost in the championship and he lost twice. Can't, obviously, you've enjoyed many successes in your life. Can you tell us about a shortcoming or a failure that you used to catapult yourself to a success? You know, I, I probably have um, more cookies that burned in the oven uh, than batches that were actually perfectly baked. Um, now, whether I shine the light on all of the, now you guys gave me this platform to talk about as though I've done um, nothing but championships because you've created that platform where we've been only talking about things that have worked. Every day, a part of our business culture is that that's the whole idea behind Six Sigma. You're going to fail. You're going to create a better mousetrap every day. Today I'm convinced, today I'm absolutely convinced that what we have done the past eight years was not the most innovative thing. It was the thing that I thought was most innovative, but our team's challenge is to constantly say, how can we get better today? And I'm confident that two years from now, we'll look at this and we'll think that, you know, we'll, this is prehistoric. And so I'm sure LeBron thinks the same way. You know, he has, you know, he likes to say four, five, six, seven, right? In his mind, he may win 18 championships. So while we think that, you know, he could potentially, I still don't think he is Jordan, but potentially uh, claim that mantle, we don't know yet because, he's, in my mind, a young guy, still raw dough. We've placed him in the oven. He's not fully baked yet. We don't know what's going to happen in the next five to seven years for him. He may be ten times better than Jordan. Who knows? I can't see it, but it, it's possible. Um, I, I, I see it only because he's great. He's surrounded by good people, and if he has the right mentality, it doesn't rest on his bars, but understands that there are weaknesses in your game. Michael Jordan's greatest strength was that he was gifted in the beginning with great athleticism, but he also was one of the head of competitive spirit, Kobe Bryant-like competitive spirit, with the athletic ability of a LeBron James and a, and a killer instinct and, and, and the willingness to take the ball and the pressure in the beginning. LeBron didn't have that in the beginning, now he has it. He, has to, he had to evolve. Lebr uh, Michael had the benefit of Kobe and LeBron's strengths to, in just one person. Uh, what was great about Michael was, because he had that, in the latter portion of his career, he didn't have to rely on his physical prowess. He was much more of a different player. He was a thinker. He was a leader. He willed his team to win because he pivoted and changed with the times and dealt with the weaknesses that he had. Now, you know, I, there are certain areas I'm clearly weak on, but I surround myself with those position players to make up for my weaknesses. So I think uh, there are a lot of mistakes we make on a constant basis. I'm not the most politically correct person in the world. Uh, I have people like John who's sitting over there and Alex Parade and others, they cringe every time I send out an email. I'm just not careful, right? And in a hypersensitive, politically correct world where everything can be scrutinized with a, with a jaundiced eye saying, what was the intent? You know, I'm the wrong guy. I'm Archie Bunker in this world. <laughs> and, and I have people around me to make sure that I'm, I'm doing the right things. And I, you know, I, I don't have the polish and the savvy that I probably should have uh, in an environment that I uh, like a law firm. And that's why I rely on Johns of the world and others to make sure that I'm not getting in trouble, right? That I'm not offending people unintentionally. And, and, and LeBron has that, right? So I'm filled with weaknesses. I mean, I'm not going to expose it now. But uh, <laughs> look, starting from the wig and all the way down, you know, there's <laughs> nothing but weaknesses, yeah. That's terrific. Well, I think we're just about out of time. Um, AJ, it's been terrific talking with you this today. This has been great. Thank you so much for joining us. Congratulations. Good to be your... back home. Good to be back home, Temple. Congratulations on your induction to the Gallery of Success. And students, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, James.